Welcome to the indoor garden. There may be several areas in your home or office where you'd really like to have a plant, except for one important detail. There's very little light. Well, today we're going to take a look at some plants that will live in very little light. And what I mean by low light is an area several feet away from a window or if you have a light meter, one that's 50 to 150 foot candles. So that's about what I'm talking about. So let's get started and look at these nice low light plants. An excellent choice for a place like that, or just about any of your low light spots, would be a Dracaena Janet Craig. And this is the Dracaena Janet Craig right here. And this too is the Dracaena Janet Craig. Now sometimes people ask me, they say, well, this plant's name is Janet, so does that mean that it's a female plant? Well, no, it doesn't. Actually, there are some plants which are male and female, but the Dracaenas aren't one of those. So if you want to, you can call your plant Janet, or you can call it Harold, or Irving, or you can just refer to it as your plant. That's fine. Whatever you want to do, it won't mind at all. And if you ever hybridize a plant, which actually the Dracaena is, this particular Dracaena Janet Craig is a hybrid of another Dracaena. And if you ever hybridize a plant, you can name it whatever you want. I really don't like to say how often you should water your plants because there's so many factors that can affect that. Even the change of seasons when they're getting more or less light or when you turn on air conditioning or turn on the heat, all those things can affect how often it needs water. But I can tell you how much water to water it and I can tell you how you'll know that it does need water. And in the case of the Janet Craig right here, what you want to do is feel in the soil about an inch and a half down. And when it's dry, that far down, then water it with about a pint of water. And with the 8-inch Dracaena, you want to feel down almost 2 inches. Make sure it's dry almost that far down before you go ahead and water it with about a quart of water. And that'll do it. There are a few things you can do for your Dracaena, Janet Craig, to keep it looking really good. And one of the most important things, I think, is to keep it dusted. It does have really nice, shiny, deep green leaves, and they tend to show dust pretty easily. So when you're dusting the rest of your house, then just go ahead and dust your Janet Craig, too. It'll really appreciate it. And I personally prefer to use a feather duster, although that's not absolutely necessary. Now, if after you've dusted it, it's still looking kind of gray, and it doesn't have that old shine that it used to, you can go to your nursery or garden center and get a good commercial plant cleaner. And what you do with that is just spray it on the leaves, just like this and then get a paper towel or a soft rag and just wipe it off and you'll see the old shine come back almost right away. And if you don't want to do that, if you don't feel like going to the garden center or the nursery to get a plant cleaner, you can always use ivory soap and water. But you have to remember to rinse it off when you're done. But your plant will look great. And also, don't forget to fertilize it that's a wonderful thing to do for all your plants. The Aspidistra alatior would be a very good choice for a place like that. It's one of our hardiest and most tolerant of low light plants. And this is it right here. 
Its common name is the cast iron plant, and it was given that name during Victorian times when most houses had gas lighting, and because the gas would sometimes escape from the lights, it was very difficult to grow house plants. But the cast iron plant would grow through anything, and even in these times, it'll still grow through anything. An excellent, excellent choice. And especially for you people out there who think that you don't have a green thumb, I highly recommend trying one of these cast iron plants. The cast iron plant, which is not a very fussy plant at all, still a little extra attention given to it now and then would be nice. And one thing it likes is to have its leaves dusted. Most of your plants can get dusty and the cast iron plant, even though it's sturdy, it still gets dusty. So once in a while, take up your feather duster and go ahead and dust off those wide green leaves and it'll breathe better and it'll take in a little more light and you probably aren't giving it much light anyway so it's a nice thing to do and of course you do want to water this plant now it doesn't need water very often especially if it's sitting in a fairly dark place but what you want to do is check the soil from time to time and when it's dry about an inch and a half below the soil surface and check a couple spots see how it's doing then go ahead and give it about a quart of water now if you do happen to have this in a bright place where it maybe even gets a little bit of sun then go ahead and give it two quarts of water and one other thing to note on these is occasionally they do get spider mites so what you want to do is check underneath the undersides of the leaves every once in a while and see if there are any mites there and I'll show you what I mean there actually doesn't appear to be any mites on this plant but you want to look right along the center vein especially and you would see like little tiny white specks kind of clustered on either side and if you start seeing that then get yourself right away to the garden center or your florist or some place that has a good insecticide for your plants now every once in a while as a bonus, your cast iron plant may actually bloom for you. And it is one of the weirdest blooming plants I've ever seen. It actually blooms right above its soil. It'll get little purple cup-shaped flowers that appear right above the soil. It's very strange, and it may happen every once in a while, so keep your eyes out for those. And that's about it. For those tight spaces, there's no plant better than the snake plant or the Sansevieria. And this is the Sansevieria right here, also known as the snake plant or a mother's-in-law tongue or a good luck plant and sometimes even known as a devil's tongue. So you can call it whatever you'd like, but this is it. And if you look at it really closely, I think you'll see why it's called the snake plant because its markings, which are really very beautiful when you look at them up close, are very similar to what one might see on a snake. So there you have it. And this is a, a really super plant. It's an almost trouble-free plant. Another great plant for those people who think they can't grow plants. This is one you really can't go wrong with. Just almost forget about it. You do have to water it occasionally, but if, on, if you only did that, it would probably be happy. Now, there are a couple other interesting things I wanted to note about this, and one is the fact that it blooms. Now, you wouldn't think of a plant like this as really being a bloomer, but it is. And here you go, you can see it's, it's got white, almost trumpet-shaped flowers and they grow up on a long spike and every once in a while they'll come up. And the other thing to note about it is as much as this is a very hardy plant, 
it does have its Achilles heel, so to speak, only we'll call them Achilles tips because it's the tips of the plant that are very sensitive. And if you break off a tip, like this one here is broken off just a little bit, but if you do that, then the leaf won't grow anymore. This one won't get any taller than this now. It'll just stop. So you want to be a little careful about those plant tips. Otherwise, you should have no problem at all. It's a great plant. Yes, you can make cuttings from the snake plant, and I'll show you how in just a minute. But I did want to mention one other thing, and that is how to water your snake plant. And you want to let it get really dry. If you have one that's this big in a 10-inch pot, you stick your finger down as far as you can feel, and it should be really dry. They would much rather sit on the dry side than be overwatered. They'll just rot if you do that. Now, they do tend to really fill up a pot, so sometimes it's hard to get your finger down in there. So another way you can tell if it's getting dry is to pick it up and see how much it weighs. And this one today weighs quite a bit. So just occasionally go by and pick it up, see if it's drying out. And it's a good way to bond with your plant, too. So that's all you need to do as far as watering goes. And now we'll get to the cuttings. I'm going to take, make cuttings actually from this one leaf here, and I'm choosing a leaf where the tip has been broken since it's not going to grow anymore anyway. And what you want to do is cut a leaf at the very base, as close to the base of the pot as you can, and then kind of lay it out here and you want to make three to four inch sections out of the leaf that you cut. So I'll make a few of them here right now. This looks good. And then you take your sections and put them right into a pot of potting soil and I'm using a clay pot today. I prefer to use a clay pot with plants that like to stay on the dry side because the clay pot itself dries out a lot faster. So you can use plastic if you want, that's fine, but I personally prefer the clay. So just stick those little sections in about a half an inch and they'll all be sitting out it looks kind of funny, but this is actually how they get started. And then, when you're all done, you can water it. Although there is one other thing I should tell you. If you're using the variety of, of snake plant that I'm using today, which is the Sansevieria laurenti, when the new snakes appear, they'll actually be all green. They won't have this yellow border. I don't know why they do that. I'm sure there's a logical botanical reason for it, but that's what they do. So we'll just get out our water here, and these snakes will be on their way. If they fall over a little, just Set them upright and uh, get them in there firm in the pot. And before you know it, you'll see baby snakes. A nice compact plant that'll really do the job for you on your desktop or coffee table is the Aglaonema maria. And again, I have a plant here with a feminine name. And no, it's not a female plant, but I just wanted to let you know that. However, it does get flowers, which is kind of nice. And I can show them to you here on this little larger Aglaonema maria. And they're right down in here. They just get little clusters of whitish green 
leaves. This isn't a great example. But there it is. This one's getting ready to uh, pop out any minute. But that's kind of a nice bonus. And if you want a little bigger plant, you like the Aglaonema Maria, but you've got a bigger space to fill than just a coffee table, then this 10-inch one would probably be just fine. Now, as far as the care on it goes, you want to keep these just slightly on the moist side. So you let this one here in the 6-inch pot dry out about an inch below the soil line and then give it about a pint of water. And with the 10 inch Aglo Maria, you can stick your finger down in about two inches when it's this size and then give it a quart of water when it's ready. Now as much as they are very hardy plants, there is one thing you should know about them, and they don't like temperatures below 50 degrees. So if you've had one outside or you buy one during the winter time, make sure that you keep it on the warm side. The Aglaonema Maria is very hardy. And to demonstrate this, I want to tell you about the, how the other day when I was at the shopping mall, I ran into this Aglaonema Maria, more or less. It was sitting under a rock. Somebody had actually put a rock on top of this poor plant. It was a rock about this size, and they had taken it out of a planter box in the mall and all you could see were little green things coming out of the ends of the rock. Well, I took the rock off the plant, and I took it home and I watered it, and I brought it here to show you today just how sturdy the Aglaonema Maria really is. And as you can see, it does have some yellow leaves on it that are dried up, but for the most part, it really doesn't look too bad. And is evidence of that awful rock sitting on top of it. You can see its pots all broken and cracked. And I'll have to take this home and repot it really soon. Now, while plants are often taken for granted, especially those in shopping malls, My friend, Mr. Bobby Green, has something to say to you on this rarely discussed subject. Howdy folks, my name is Bob B. Green and I work for the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Plants and Malls across America. You know, the SPCPIMAA, the shopping malls my beat. Hooey, I tell you, some of the things I've seen in this place would make your ferns shudder and your vines crawl, I'm telling you. Now, just because the music at the mall is fake doesn't mean the plants are too. No, sir, plants are living beings, just like wolverines or wombats. Only plants can clean and refresh that trapped air that's, that's polluted inside here. Wolverines and wombats can't do that. Now then. The job of a hard-working shopping mall plant isn't made any easier by shoppers who abuse them. Now, come on, let me show you. Cigarettes are made from tobacco, which is a plant. <laughs> you know, by putting a lip match to the end of tobacco, you are, by definition, committing cruelty to plants. <laughs> you light a cigarette at the end of a wombat, it, it, he'll bite the heck out of you, I guarantee you. <laughs> now, secondly, did you know that tobacco contains over 4,700 chemical compounds? Now, I can guarantee you, your bottom carbon monoxide molecule, that those compounds ain't good for nobody. <laughs> Finally, how would you like to be on the receiving end of one of these several times a day? Ladies and gentlemen, plants are not ashtrays. Plants are natural air fresheners. Now, without any complaint or pay, they work overtime sucking up all them nasty compounds and turning them into fresh air. Ah. <sighs> 
And what about them junior plant abusers? You know, the future leaders of America? Why, their diet consists of nothing but gooey candy, greasy fries, sticky sodas, and wads and wads of weirdly flavored bubble gum. Yeah, watermelon flavored and strawberry flavored and grape flavored and so on and so forth. Now, all these flavors are named, of course, after cousins of our friend here, Mr. Plant. But do you think they show Mr. Plant any respect? No, sir. Now, this stuff is not fertilizer, folks. It's like nuclear waste or uh, styrofoam cups or taxes. You just can't get rid of this stuff. Just like those people that don't believe the plants are real live breathing beings. You know the type. The ones that just can't resist walking by a bunch of plants and plucking their leaves so they can't breathe. You pluck the leaf off a wombat, you'll be missing your leaves, I'll tell you what. Let's see, where's that rest of that stuff? Them darn junior abusers. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say is, we at the SPCPIMAA would just like you to be a little more considerate about the needs and rights of our green neighbors. Just remember, what we're breathing out, they're breathing in. And without them, heck, we wouldn't be breathing at all. I mean, we are in this all together, right? Humans, plants, wolverines, and wombats. Hey, uh, what the heck is a wombat anyway? It's an animal, right? I hope that we will start giving them the care and respect that they truly deserve. So take good care of your plants, and they'll reward you with years of pleasure and clean air. Well, my first letter says, Dear Liz, after a full year of blooming, my African violet stopped blooming. Its leaves look good, but how can I get it to bloom again? And this is from Mrs. Greenwell. Well, I'll tell you. After a plant's been blooming for a long time, they like to take a rest. And you probably would too if you've been blooming as long as that African violet. So that's probably all it's doing, especially if its leaves look really good. But just continue to take good care of it and give it African violet food, and it'll probably start blooming again for you in the next few months. Now let's see what else I have. Okay, here's a letter here. This says, my mother says that cleaning plant leaves with mayonnaise works like a charm. Is this true from Gladys Ryan? Gladys, that's a horrible thing to do. You really don't want to clean your plant leaves with mayonnaise. They're just so oily, it clogs the pores. No, no, it's terrible. Use ivory soap and water or a plant cleaner from your florist or garden center, but no mayonnaise. Okay, let's see. One more. Dear Liz, someone gave me one of those wonderful aloe vera plants that heal minor burns so nicely. Will it live all right in my kitchen window, which gets a lot of morning sun? And this is from Tom Siegel. Yes, an aloe vera sitting in an east-facing window with full morning sun will do wonderfully. In fact, just about anything will do wonderful in an east light. It just seems that the morning sun's perfect for just about any plant. It's never too much, and it's never too little. Well, that's about it for my letters today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.